Not too often when you get applause for um, talking about poop. And, and, I, and um, I'll give you a little background, but you know, I know you guys are studying water issues and stuff like that, for particularly those in PTK. And of course, we were affected by water issues because we've had about what, an average of three feet of water that was contaminated with a lot of sewage. And so what I'd like to do with this talk is look at the state of our water, particularly why is sewage a problem? Why is flooding a problem? So I'm gonna be compiling about five hours worth of talk into about 20 minutes. And I wanna leave a lot, a lot of time for Q and A. And the thing is, is it's funny, because uh, I didn't want to be asked to do this locally, because when you're on a campus, nobody believes you do anything and no one thinks of you as an expert, usually you bring someone else in. So like if I'm, I'm invited to do this somewhere else, I'm an expert, but here it's like, oh, that's just Dr. S. So to give you a little background about why I'm talking about this is, is this is an area for me that is very important. I just have to show off that I do do research and that happens to be in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, actually not in the middle, but it's about 120 miles off the Gulf of Mexico. And um, what I'm doing is sending, that's called a rove, and we're sending a, a sub, basically a, a, pilot, a remote controlled submarine, that thing costs as much as one of these buildings, okay, down into the Gulf about anywhere from about 150 to that baby goes about 600 feet. It does have a line on it. We have a 600 foot cable on that. It's very tricky. But what we were looking at was the effects of Harvey on a coral reef called Flower Gardens Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Because believe it or not, everything you throw into a ditch or into your sewers ends up there in the Gulf of Mexico with everything that comes from Louisiana and also uh, the Rio Grande River. So it is a very delicate area and we were looking at the effects of the sewage contamination, believe it or not, from Harvey and from Louisiana and other flooding events. So it is important stuff. And could I promote the 21st, the evening of the 21st on this campus, we are having a showing of a video called uh, Chasing Coral. And you know coral are sedentary creatures, you don't trace them because you'll run into them. But um, it is important because part of the work here that I do is with a marine sanctuary uh, board for the past three years. So why am I giving this talk? Because for six years, I've been on a group called Na uh, the Houston Galveston Area Council. It represents 16 counties that make up our area and a heck of a lot of people in space. It also represents every environmental issue. So I've been working with them for 20 years when I was two years old. Okay, and um, I've been serving on the committee called the BIG, and the BIG means Bacterial Implementation Group. And we were basically six years ago forced, I'm gonna say forced, because Texas doesn't like doing a lot of environmental policy things if we don't have to. So we were basically heavily recommended by the Environmental Protection Agency, a federal agency, to monitor fecal contamination in our waters. And Texas and Louisiana are probably the two worst states for having fecal contamination. And we're also, we're actually number one as a state for uncontrollable flooding. And what's called a, a, a lack of resilience, that means recovery from flooding. We're actually one of the worst. Isn't that nice to know? I always like being number one. So when we have flooding, there are a lot of issues, but pr probably one of the worst ones is sewage. And so a lot of us don't know what happens when we flush the toilet. We think a lot of that goes to toilet heaven and we never see it. But we're gonna look at the implications of when you flush the toilet and even when you dump stuff on the ground and the implications of walking your dogs and not picking up the poop and the implications of wild pigs and birds and other stuff on fecal contamination in our water. So I'm gonna to try to make this brief and leave enough time for you to answer questions. So I'm gonna just give enough information to hopefully entice you about sewage contamination and its prevalency. And growing up in New York City, being raised on an area called Coney Island, which is a heavy beachfront area as a kid, I used to fish because we didn't have enough money to eat. So we'd literally fish to eat. And the problem was that, was that I would do it at a sewage contaminated water that would sometimes wash up on the beach and turn my feet black and sticky because as kids you didn't know what it was. So sewage contamination is an old problem, goes back to the ancient times of what do we do with our poo? And usually we just ship it to someone else or put it somewhere place else and that hasn't changed in several thousand years. 
So when we look at the topic of this talk is when we look at flooding, why is that affecting sewage treatment? And I think that's very important for you to understand because one of the things that has impacted the most that we don't have an infrastructure to correct is sewage. So anytime we get flooding, you're looking at somewhere in this area, a sewage treatment plant being affected and overflowing, which is actually sometimes part of the policy of dealing with floodwaters. We do what's called reduction and mitigation rather than prevention, which is almost impossible when you look at sewage treatment design. And if any of you want a good career, you can go into sewage treatment design. I'm serious, it's actually a fun part of engineering, but not the kind of thing you tell your parents, this is what I'm going to college for. So, of course, in Houston, and I'm now representing Houston Garrison Area Council as far as what our position is, that means a combination of special interest groups and government of what makes flooding occur here. We take official stands. So obviously, it's heavy precipitation over many days. Duh, why is that politically important to say? Because we blame unusual weather events and sometimes uncommon weather events on the flooding. So we have people that serve with me that say flooding is really not a problem in Houston. It's the unpredictable weather, which we call unexpected or unusual events. Because they do occur rarely and infrequently, and we feel that we are victims of them, and no matter what we do, we don't have control. So please understand that. Because when we start looking at saying, why is sewage runoff a problem? That's the problem. We just gotta stop rain. And we start looking at global climate change and what that can do to weather patterns. We have to look at the consequence that of sewage events, what we call sewage release events or outflow events. Um, overflowing of rivers and lakes, obviously, because we're gonna see how they're intimately attached to sewage treatment plants. Because any of you go fishing in local waterways or swimming in like any of the bayous? Okay, guess where we dump our sewage? Yeah, I mean, not raw, but treated to the point of 90% clean. So the other 10% you gotta worry about. So overflowing of rivers and lakes is the primary problem. So when rivers and lakes can't drain quickly or fill up quickly, you're looking at what we call a sewage release event, or at least a raw sewage release event. And then of course, there's severe storms. And that doesn't come under regular precipitation events. This comes under tropical storms. Because again, these are unpredictable, they're not periodic, and we see, and they're hard to plan for. I mean, nobody plans for 40 inches of rain. Nobody plans for 20 inches of rain unless you're in a tropical climate that deals with it. And even then, they deal with sewage events regularly. I've seen that in, in Colombia, in the Philippines, and other areas where I've traveled and worked, in Samoa, you name it. So countries with that type of rainfall deal with this all the time. We're just not accustomed to it and not as accepting of it. So when we look at flooding in our area, yes, we blame unusual events, but also some of the blame comes with typical urbanization. And two terms you hear of in the flood language is this whole idea of uh, what we call water diversion and permeable habitats. So water diversion means when it does rain, where does that rain flow? What is our watershed? Has anybody ever heard the term watershed? Because it just means what's our flow pattern? In Texas, your flow pattern is from uh, northwest to southeast. And guess who's at the base of most of the Texas watershed? We collect about probably, I'd say, at least 50% to 60% of the water that rains on Texas. Because it all funnels in through what we call our bayous, our minor watersheds, and, and floodplains into this area. So we're real close to the base of where all this water floods from across Texas. And yes, that is an issue, and that's called resource diversion. So we pay attention to this, where this rain's coming from, and as, as, uh, as cities, what we do is try to redirect this water or find ways to keep it within a river bank or divert it to other banks. And a lot of, you don't see a lot of these efforts. We do this usually with dams, like the Barker Cypress Dam, Lake Houston Dam, we try to collect sometimes 
and redirect this water in the form of reservoirs, which we could use for fishing, swimming, and in the future, pretty soon, we'll be drinking out of Lake Houston. I mean, not directly like an antelope, but through water treatment plants. So think about that, because I'm gonna tell you what goes into uh, Lake Houston, unfortunately, that you'll be drinking out of, just remember that. You got a few years ago. Permeable habitat just means forest and grass and soil. Rain typically permeates soil where it forms underground bodies of water in a water table that tends to flow away in the direction of the watershed too. Unfortunately, that quickly fills up with a heavy rain event because Houston is actually classified as an arid climate. We don't get much water, we're not supposed to get much rainfall, and when we do, it's expected that our soil, which does have some shallow clays, it's called, forms like a, a, a pan underneath the soil, and water can just saturate so far, and then it becomes what we call surface flow, which of course is directed into the watershed, bayous, rivers, and whatever. So this is another issue with us. Uh, our drainage system right now that we have in existence was designed for a 1950s population Houston. And if you ever have nothing better to do, go to a website called Houston Galveston Area Council, and it will lead you to what's called a GIS system, and you can look at the history of Houston permeable space from 1950 to today. And what that means, how much soil and plants were there in the 50s compared to today, and you're gonna see that we've lost almost about 60% of our permeable space and replaced it with parking lots, cement, and highways. So think about all that rain that fell in the old days and caused no flooding, and now it is. And this is something we don't like addressing, because what are we gonna do? Undo highways, tear up your driveway, and do other things? There are uh, the options beyond cement are very expensive, and at this point, not a problem. And I'm gonna wait for you guys to ask questions about that. And again, this goes into, we have an obsolete draining infrastructure in Houston. So do many cities. Almost every, particularly older cities like New York, the Northeast, Boston, Chicago. I was just in Chicago and um, we didn't have a rain event. I mean, I lived up there for a while, but we did have a rain event. We also had sewage leaking into the Chicago River and of course into Lake Michigan. So that was not unusual. So again, when we look at particularly older cities, What's funny is Houston is not an old, old city, but we still have a city that has old planning considering our population growth. I mean, we're one of the fastest growing cities. We're gonna be bigger than Chicago. And yet our sewage infrastructure is probably less adequate than Chicago's because they started out big, we didn't. Sorry about that, Texas. We did something that wasn't big, when well, now it is. So what are some issues with flooding? And this is kind of funny. So when I look at flooding, we blame weather, we blame urbanization, we blame everything except what I like to do with my students is point a laser at them and say, we could also blame you. So what are your habits that affect how sewer systems respond to flooding? And this is kind of funny, because I'm a cook, I'm a damn good cook. I mean, I'm serious. Uh, every country I've been in, I learned to cook. So. I produce a lot of grease, because I cook a lot with stuff. Bacon fat, yummy. And I know what to do with the stuff, whereas not all of us do. One of the major bad habits that we have that, believe it or not, results in sewage flooding and overflow and even flooding in general is grease disposal. And I'm not talking about fast food restaurants, other types of restaurants and industries, because they are regulated to have that stuff sucked out of a pit and sent off and turned into biodiesel that smells like, you know, McDonald's French fries. It's kind of fun to be behind one of those cars. It makes you hungry when you smell the McDonald's fries that it's running on, I'm serious. In a household, how many of you have heard that you shouldn't put grease down a drain? Very good, because you guys are a little more socially active. How many of you are told even, no, even when the pot is greasy, you should not rinse the grease out? How many of you use a paper towel? which is killing a tree, but they're dead anyway now. I mean, that tree, that's a paper towel, so seriously. You could use a cloth, but the problem is that cloth, the grease goes in the wash machine in the system. So we're finding out that grease is one of the major problems, and you see this in every country. 
I was in the London sewer system once. I even show a video of that to my students. And I saw grease that was about the thickness in the pipes was from here to here. And people have to go in and scrape it out for a pretty good wage. So in Houston, we find out that grease is a major problem when it comes to when you use toilets, when you use kitchens, and how that eventually causes sewage systems to flood. Isn't that kind of funny? And this is a big campaign Houston puts out. And really, when we monitor the stuff, we find out nobody listens. We have a lot of backflow. Street litter is a major area of flooding. Now, what's nice about your drainage ditches here, unlike New York City, stuff that ends up in the street does not go through a sewage treatment plant because it clogs them up. Unless you have huge facilities like in New York that can deal with it, or like in London, we, we just don't do that. So think about that next time something spills in a, a street, a yard, or your dog poops in a yard, that goes directly into the bayous and into Lake Houston and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico because we're in what's called the San Jacinto outflow. So this is kind of interesting. So litter is a major thing too because it clogs ditches along the way. It builds dams. I don't know if any of you ever seen dams made out of litter. The litter just accumulates, a branch gets in the water, and it forms a literal dam that will back up water all the way upstream. And I mean, a powerful dam. It's surprising how much litter can hold back when it comes to rain events, and particularly in small drainage areas. Uh, and a lot of it also gets into San Jacinto River and basically forms a carpet on the bottom of the river that makes the river shallow. So this is kind of a problem too. And then when we look at bad habits, our own habits of contributing to climate change. Now this is a long-term thing, but, it's, but when we look at the history of air quality, it's really a short-term thing. So when we start looking at habits of global climate change, it means what do I drive rationally? What do I do as far as heating my house, cooling my house? Everything that involves some type of production of a gas, CO2 or methane, anything that involves fossil fuels, you know, that is contributing to flooding because we do know it impacts rainfall. And Houston, which is normally arid, we're looking at becoming wetter. I mean, if you want to really invest in some beachfront property for the next 30 years, move to Huntsville and you will have it pretty soon. You know, maybe within, a, I mean, I'm kind of a little over exaggerating, but I'm serious about that. We're already seeing parts of Bolivar Peninsula and other areas that are going to be permanently underwater. And a lot of cities, I mean, look at Venice. That's a very similar, I mean, think about them. They were normally a very wet city due to the nature of their soil, but they're almost a model for Galveston. So, I mean, Galveston would be a very unique place in the future because you'll have to wear boots to get around and do tourism unless we just abandon the island. That's actually, there's some ideas for doing that. And that means that water also is going to affect their sewage drainage. Because if they can't flow water out of the island, where does the sewage go? So how does a sewage treatment plant work? This is my favorite part, okay? And my students know that when I get cremated, half of me is going down the toilet. And that's for real. Because I want, this is the ultimate of engineering for me because it also is one of the things that have allowed humanity to thrive when you're able to get rid of sewage and prevent sewage contamination and disease. It has reduced juvenile deaths in countries from one in th um, three children dying to almost none. So think about that when we look at sewage. This is not a joke. It's not just stinky. It is dangerous and the most complex stuff we study in environmental science. And it's very expensive. So if you don't live in a country with a lot of money, you don't monitor it. It's very difficult, or we use crude methods to do it. So typical of a sewage treatment plant, and that's one that's flooded, that's from our area, is that how do these things work? Basically, hopefully all of you go in the toilet, because don't go in your yard, because that washes directly into our waterways. It, the stuff goes in the toilet, and it goes through a pipe that flows down into the sewage treatment plant, okay? And our, we have a closed system. That means street water doesn't go in there to inundate it. So all that water is coming from you. The problem is, is a lot of that water doesn't need to be treated, like from sinks and other stuff. And really, that's the worst stuff to put into a sewage system because it has food waste and other things that have to be removed. And it takes time and a lot of expense. So really, what we should be putting down there is just toilets, but we don't. So we get 
about 10 times more volume of water than we need flowing through a sewage treatment plant. Once the, so uh, some cities actually have diversion canals, we don't, that take excess water, because I hate to tell you this, the heavy chunks kind of sink a little, and we can divert them and take the water that's somewhat clean and put it into a pipe that goes directly into a river. But what happens is that when water goes into a sewage treatment plant, it relies on once water is treated, like in those little things there, that goes into a pipe and has to drain into a river. So there's two, so when we look at how a sewage treatment plant works, it is just taking your stuff, separating it, and sometimes doing what we call reclaiming the water. That means we can use it for another purpose, or we can fill a reservoir with it, I hate to say that, or recharge a river. That's what reclaiming means. The water that comes out of a sewage treatment plant is, a 90, is about 90% cleaned. We can afford to do it 100 in our city. It's very expensive and 90% is good. It's, I mean, it's some of the cleanest water in the United States. If you want the cleanest water in the United States, go to New York City. They sell the stuff. It's called bottled water. It comes out of a tap. Isn't that funny? So, but, but, they put, but they, in early times, put in the expense of having what we call quaternary treatment of water. We do what's called tertiary treatment. That means we get rid of most of the bad stuff. So most of the stuff that's bad gets removed and it gets put into a landfill. We remove it or it goes, sometimes it's decontaminated, put into the Gulf of Mexico. But the point is what causes sewage uh, uh, flooding is when not too much water gets into there, because guys, it's not raining in your house and into your toilets. It's when these things can't drain. And when they can't drain, they back up and do this. That's supposed to be dry. So they back up and do this, and sometimes that water backs up into your house, but most of the time we have an overflow pipe to keep it from getting into your house, and we dump raw sewage into the river, which is monitored. Believe me, we have to monitor everything over about a couple of thousand gallons per sewage treatment plant because a little release is not that bad. I mean, it's acceptable, we have acceptable limits. So when we look at something like this, guys, that's very typical in the city of Houston, because this is basically a normal drainage pipe that would take sewage from a city and put it into a bayou, does that make sense? Through a large pipe, and when the bayou is filled, where does, sewage tr where does treated water go? Because sometimes we pump this down through a pumping station to make sure it flows to a river. Well, if the pump gets backed up, you shut it down. And that water then backs up into here, and then it backs up into streets. And if, you're not, and if you don't let it back up into streets, it backs up into individual houses. So what's your choice? So hard decisions are made with this, when we look at this. And when we start looking at grease in the pipes and litter that's blocking the drainage of the bayous, and even these pipes sometimes, because sometimes these pipes that they put sewage also take drainage water. So this causes further backup and exacerbates it. So we're part of the problem in a way when we look at this. So what is normal sewage outflow? We measure it in what's called uh, uh, to, uh, uh, maximum daily limits of what we consider to be bad water. So we set a level in this country, we look at how much volume of junk should get out. And this is a typical makeup of sewage. Unfortunately, it does contain oil and grease, but that number, that number is even too high, 1%. It really should be about zero. We have junk in there, metals. We look at oxygen, the amount of oxygen in that water, nutrients, that means your poop and other stuff, um, and, you know, the, the, the nutrients from your poop and pee, and then we look at trash that can end up in there, because how many of you like throw garbage in your toilet? Or like a stuffed animal ended up in there and you just, give it burial at sea. Actually, bury on the Gulf of Mexico, whatever, so whatever. And then there's, sometimes we get what are called toxic organics. That means household cleaners. So this is a major part of sewage. I mean, feces is there somewhere, because that comes underneath, you know, nutrients and bacteria, because that's where the bacteria are coming from, is your feces, and the feces of other creatures that you might have as pets. So when we look at normal sewage outflow, we're talking about the poo in sewage today, because that's the committee I work on. And when we look at poo, guys, it is an incredible complexity of microorganisms that we standardize to look at what is safe water. So typical sewage water, 
for Houston, and don't worry about the bacteria, has a certain fingerprint of bacteria that we recognize as safe if you were to consume small amounts, or if it were to get into the environment, or if you were to swim in it. And we set levels based on that fingerprint. When we look at contaminated water, that's a typical fingerprint of what should not happen. So we have normal water that does have normal bacteria or should be in normal you know, households, and then we have contaminants. That means what happens when things go wrong and the sewage treatment plant is not removing the bad stuff. So we have some bacteria that are pathogenic that are removed, and then we have some what we call good bacteria, I mean they're not gonna hurt you, that in normal water is high, but look what happens to the pathogens here. They get higher in proportion to that, and you start seeing people develop skin diseases, diarrhea, uh, meningitis, you name it, flesh-eating staph from those, because normally flesh-eating staph are very low, they can get pretty high in waterways that, that have raw sewage. So this is amazing when we look at the complexity of this. And how do we measure this? It's difficult. We have to do it at periods where there's rainfall, no rainfall. When, you know, um, we have to pay attention to tide, because sometimes when a tide comes in, it makes it difficult for sewage to run out, because you have what are called tidal rivers. That means when the Gulf of Mexico produces a tide in, water's coming in, and what's happened to your sewage? It's fighting against the current and could back up. And this is the danger sometimes when a flood occurs as tide is coming in. It's actually pushing sewage back up and possibly into a household. So we have to make contingencies for that too. And so, you know, again, we will look at it. So we have a lot of ways of measuring this and a lot of ways of understanding this. And again, I'm not gonna go into all the technical. So, and we can even identify bacteria from every imaginable animal. So we know if there's feces in a waterway like right now, uh, San Jacinto is what we call an impaired body of water. That's because it has a lot of human fecal material in it. And how do we know where it comes from? We do DNA analysis, and we can tell a pig from a dog, from a duck, from a cat. I'm serious. We can now even indicate individual people almost from the DNA of the bacteria. So I can tell whose poop that is in the water if I was to collect all your DNA. Isn't that nice to know? Okay, we can even tell how much you're producing probably. So what does Houston look like as far as sewage in our waterways? We're actually doing pretty well. Since 2005, when we did not have federal policies pushing on us to reduce fecal contamination, um, we were very high. And notice as we're going to today, what's happening? We're lowering it. And a lot of this is due to better monitoring, better construction and retrofitting of sewage treatment plants, flood diversion, we are doing that, but also educating the public about grease and litter and have a very strict litter campaigns. We're also very, getting better about diverting water when it floods. So we will dam water up, we'll put it into retention ponds and things like that. Because it's really kind of funny when you look at water control, yes, I don't want to flood a neighborhood, but if I'm going to be an environmental planner, I want to, I want to protect us from sewage treatment overflow first. And that becomes a priority where we place sewage treatment plants. That's the big concern right now in Kingwood is where we put a sewage treatment plant, not to the point where I don't wanna live near one because they really don't smell that bad. But am I gonna be near it? And is it gonna be placed in an area where it floods? Does that make sense? Is it gonna be high above the ground or low? Because it all depends on where you build them and where you can get the property. Because believe me, I'm not selling my backyard for one right away, which is a good drainage area. But, you know, so that comes into consideration. So we are better than we used to be. But we still, whenever we have a flood, though, we start seeing levels that get up to, I think with Harvey, the average increase in bacterial count of human feces and other stuff was about 50 to 100 times the federal guidelines. Think about that. That means if you swim in that water, you can get sick. It's like literally swimming in your toilet after you pooped. I'm serious. And that's about it. So what are the impacts of poo? Um, it was great on our campus because the plants have never grown so well in my whole life. Our nature trail is the best I've ever looked. I'm serious. So there is a benefit to pooing. You know, I should say what we call poo events. That flood in there. I mean, I think that's what the Egyptians relied on along the Nile was all that poo contaminated soil getting in their farm fields. But guys, that could also spread disease. 
So when you start getting human feces, and, why, and guys, the second most poo that ends up in our water during floods is feral pigs. Isn't that kind of funny? And then dogs is number three of the poos you gotta be careful of. Bird poo and fish poo is always gonna be there, but doesn't bother us. That's called background. I mean, I wouldn't drink it or eat it, but it's, it's at a consistent level. So, and pig poo, guys, you can get a lot of these from, and the same is true for dog poo. Dog poo is a major uh, cause of blindness in this country a long time with parasites that live in the poo. Um, I'm afraid of airports too. Airports have international poo from all over the world that contain parasites that can't be removed from sewage or get into the water when there's overflow. So farms are particularly affected because that can make that farm field unusable until that human feces is gone. So we can look at three to four years of putting a farm out of business or trying to find a way to do what's called remediation. When the city floods with poo, I mean, how do you like the fact that you're walking on a campus that has human poo all over it? I'm serious, could it be a health problem? Yeah, I mean, I would not graze off our field. I would not lick the grass until we test it. So this becomes a major, what we call a hazmat situation, where this can put places out of business and it adds to the cost of cleanup almost tenfold. We could have saved a lot of money on our campus if it didn't have a lot of poo sewage in it, we'd have been very happy. So on that note, that's the poop on poop. But the point, and, and the point to remember though, guys, is when we look at sewage treatment, there's an uncontrolled element, there's a design element to how we build sewage treatment plants, and then there's a public element of what do you know about sewage treatment plants that you contribute to this type of flooding. And I'm gonna stop it there and ask for Questions. What about the dams, like the man-made dams, and the like when they when they did they like I remember, I remember hearing about it during Harvey, like did they release the water in time or was it like something different? Because I remember my mom talking about it, but I never really understood what was going on. Okay, the the thing about dams is that it, it, it's really what the purpose of that dam is. The bark of cypress dams were meant to be flood control dams. Uh, um, Lake Houston and, and um, ah, what's the one in Conroe, don't it? Lake Conroe, they, is, it, these are recreational and also reservoir dams. That means future supplies of water. So the thing is, when, sometimes you can't, you can't have a dam get too high of water because literally if water crests over a dam, it will find a way to destroy that dam eventually or undermine the dam. Um, if the dam water's too low, not the dam, well, you know what I mean, not dam, dam. But I mean, if the water's too low in the dam, then you have problems with recreation, and some dams are used for cooling water for people. They're used for, you know, again, boating and management of water, water use. It gets to be a problem, too. So what we try to do is keep dams at what's called their optimal level. And when you get a major flood event that those dams are not meant to handle, because a typical dam might be able to handle a 15 inch rain. I mean, we design them based on past history. We never had a 28 inch, 40 inch rainfall before in one area. So that means we have to do something. And if we hear a storm's coming in that's let's say gonna be 20 inches of rain, what we can do is lower that dam to make sure it doesn't overflow. But the problem with lowering that dam, who's below the dam? that water inundates a river and floods a community. Usually a poor community lives down there. So that becomes an issue of who do I protect? But dams are very complicated when it comes to water flow. And the last thing you wanna do is damage one or leave people with boats hanging from the docks and, with, and, and, and again, exposing the sides of that dam to possible erosion. So does that answer the question in a very long, windy way? is that it's hard to talk about them because it depends on their purpose, but our goal is to protect that dam from breaking apart. And when you get big rain events or droughts, we have to find a way to manage that dam and keep it at a level that's usable. So you just said like the long way, yeah, like the whole problem in itself is like really sophisticated. There's like a lot of dots connected to it, like when you're talking about a lot of the causations of it. So I guess, so it, it would be wrong to like undermine, undermine like 
the sophistication of like the engineering of the dams and like what we have in place right now, even though to an extent, like you're saying, like in the it's from the 1950s, it's outdated. But what comes to mind is that like the whole global warming thing of like having an effect on rainfall and like it increasing rainfall and the frequency of the storms. So is our technology, like, are we not sophisticated enough to keep up with that frequency and we're going to have to make adaptations in that sense? Is there, like, some kind of technological break that we're going to have to make? Or do we have to just simply up the infrastructure as it is right now with our current technology? Or is this simply, like, an offshoot of a bigger problem that has to be addressed in order to solve this? The biggest problem is, co is cost-benefit. So when you start looking at okay, a rain event, let's say. Um, the problem with a rain event is we can't predict where that heavy rain's gonna go, and we can't build every dam for that. A, it's too expensive, B, it'd be disruptive to the infrastructure. I mean, and we, we just couldn't afford it, and it would just be unimaginable for what we'd have to do. We're doing our best by buying land away from ditches, to, we're, we're trying to buy permeable space in the city, like Bolivar Peninsula, we're leaving alone. We're not going to see any construction going on there because we want water to go somewhere and we want to prevent storm surge from backing up stuff. So there are things to do it, but the problem is, are you willing to give up your house and the community? Because we'd have to, literally, we would have to get Myerland to prevent Myerland from flooding, is we'd have to just abandon that city and put a, a water park or something. I'm serious, or something that can tolerate the flooding. So we're already past the point of engineering. What we need to do, and this is what the meteorologists are working with, is we, need be, we have to be able to pinpoint a flood event and then plan on dam releases well ahead of time. So like right now, the, US, the uh, meteorological service, they're looking at literally how they can predict every square inch of rainfall over an area, and I am serious. The only thing that's stopping them right now is computing power. They can't get enough supercomputers to do the job. So they can predict storms better because the problem that gets us are these unusual storms. The other thing we can't predict is your usage of the system and litter and sedimentation getting in and shallowing rivers and lakes and, and other things. So that, the problem is we can't predict that and monitor that very easily. So yes, it's a very complicated issue, but you don't know where to plan ahead. So for example, if I was to build up the Lake Houston Dam, we might never ever see a flood event again that affects it. And, that flood, and those flood events might occur somewhere else. So you, you just can't over-prepare. And the problem is, if you can recover from being averagely prepared, because guys, we're recovering from Harvey. We've recovered from Allison. And, and we forget about it. And as long as we can recover and forget about it, we're not gonna go crazy and build these incredible structures that give us zero chance of flooding. I mean, it's just part of nature and it's part of what you could absorb. Does that make sense? And that's why like a project called the Ike Dike, which was supposed to prevent storm surge from backing up into us and flooding store, uh, sewage systems. The cost of Ike Dike would take us 500 years to pay off if we would just allow flooding and repair. So it's cheaper for us to flood for the next 500 years than to build a dam that will significantly reduce sewage overflow. Gotcha. Any other questions? Yes. So you mentioned uh, the grease disposal and how it should be disposed. Um, what, do you have any other um, examples of things that you would do that would impact the water? Car leak, car leakage is another, you mean like as far as keeping oil and stuff out? Well, oh. And I'm serious about this. The only thing that should go down the toilet is pee and poo, um, dental floss, uh, anything, uh, even a, a napkin should not go down there. Toilet paper is now designed to disintegrate in water. I mean, I'm serious. If you store it in the garage and it's humid, it will actually start to disintegrate. Whereas most paper towels won't because they have these uh, polyester fibers in there. So that all gets clogs up sewage systems. Sewage systems have screens that screen stuff out, but dental floss, um, I hate to say it, personal hygiene stuff, anything, Band-Aids, uh, Q-tips, those all clog those screens. Those screens are not meant for it. 
And that's the primary way of separating If in the meantime, if that builds up, you can't just shut down a plant to remove that stuff. It has to be a continuous process, which they can't do. It's a periodic process. So, I mean, just little things. And again, litter, plastics in particular, they're a nuisance because of the way they break down and end up. And, 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 and basically, just the way we build here, consumers, I mean, you as, if you're gonna be a future homeowner, question where these houses are being built and question whether you need so many darn strip malls. I mean, I'm serious. This is stuff you bring up to your legislators and question a new community coming in, what's that doing to the drainage pattern of my house? That just happened in Elm Grove, where once you affect one drainage area, it affects another, and, and people in Elm Grove had sewage backup. They had sewage backup to their houses. I mean, I, don't, I owned a house there, and I know. The people that bought my house said, oh, by the way, the house is full of, you know what? So it's, it, there, there's a complexity to things, but some of it involves you being politically active and, and, and communicating to groups like Houston Galveston Area Council, because usually they'll listen and they talk to politicians. Or when a politician speaks in an area about that, you go to Q&A sessions, town meetings. These are going on all the time. But a lot of it is just small habits that we do. You know, again, and, and cars, you know, I had two cars and a motorcycle that used to leak oil, got rid of them. Some things just do that. So it's all these little things that a city our size, our population density, it builds up. Because sometimes you think, oh, I dropped something on the street. A million people drop something on the street. And if you don't pick it up, that becomes a problem. Did that answer that? So I mean, there's so many things, you know, that we do every day that affect this problem. I mean, literally the sewage problem. And I hope that answered it. Maybe it didn't, but because <laughs> that's just a complex answer. I mean, a complex problem. Yes. How much do the water filters work on the? Are they? Okay, it's it's placebo effect. Okay, so we're on aquifer water, so we don't really need we need water filters for, if you don't want the minerals. I mean, we have some of the, our ground our aquifer water is clean. We're going to be on lake water pretty soon in our area. Everyone above 610 is going to be on lake water. Your filters won't work against lake water. Now, we are going to have a sewage treatment plant here, but whatever the sewage treatment plant gets, you know, gets rid of, that, that water that's released, that 10% that's contaminated, an average water filter won't do. You would have to have such an expensive, what's called reverse osmosis unit, or a distillation unit that your water bill would be probably about 500 a month to 1,000 a month without watering your yard. The main thing I see as a future for our water is keeping shower water and sink water, that means you don't pee in the shower, separate from sewer, toilet water, and that will reduce this problem by probably 100-fold. And new houses still don't do this. If you buy a recreational vehicle, it does that, but not new houses. Some cities with, uh, that, ha that water is scarce, like Arizona, they have, a two they have a two system set up where the poop water and pee water goes into a system. The sink water goes into a system that you can water your yard with. Or that water can be re what we call recharged cleanly and not have to go through a sewage treatment plant because it is clean and it biodegrades for the most part. So I hope that answered the question too, because I tend to. <laughs> yes. Are we all pooped? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, you, when we go to our, what are called our big meetings, we are served brownies at the meeting. I'm serious. <laughs> It's kind of an inside joke, and you don't want to know how they're shaped, okay? So. <laughs> but this is a major problem, guys, and this is the primary one. Sewage is probably the worst of anything that contaminates you, because think about being back to the days where one in three children are dying from exposure to human sewage. You are so lucky. Is it working on the energy to transform the dirty water all the way to the drinking water? Is that an energy efficient 
No, it's the, it's the most energy inefficient processes in the world. And I'm glad you asked that, because guys, sewage is the most expensive thing. Sewage trimming is the most expensive thing a society can do. I'm working on a project in Bangladesh, because people don't think I do anything here sometimes, but I'm working on a project in Bangladesh for the past three years, where we're trying to reduce a certain pollutant that is removable by sewage treatment, but the Bangladesh government can't afford to run it. So what's happened is, um, it was funny, uh, the, um, it was the, the Europeans came in, because the Europeans were very concerned about the ethics of the leather, it was the leather industry, and what that was doing to the health of the Bangladeshi people. So the British said, if you don't clean up the water and stop harming your people, we're not gonna buy your leather. So the, the, Euro, the European Union came in and built this beautiful sewage treatment plant and told the Bangladeshi government to run it. The Bangladeshi government can't even have the electricity to run it. They, don't even, they can't even turn on the lights for the thing. So, to, so what happens is water is flowing into it and out of it untreated. It is so expensive to make clean water, particularly ultra clean water. Typical laboratories water is so pure it can cost $500 a gallon. I'm serious. You don't need it that clean, but still, it's the most expensive thing in the world to do, except if you drive a Bentley or something like that. My last question is, what are the things you try to repair, the, the, the things on the priority list after flooding? Usually it's preventing sewage outflow. So you try to find ways to get storm water away from a sewer system. I'm sorry, I mean, from the treatment plant itself. And that's, that's being worked on right now in Houston. How do you divert water away from the sewers and we won't have outflow, but that doesn't stop the flooding. But the thing is the worst part about the flooding, again, is that sewage. Flooding you can recover, sewage is hard to do. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.